Hello guys, welcome to the Brain Bee. My name is Ernesto Navarro. I'm a master student at UCF and I want to welcome you guys to this awesome event. I hope you guys learn a lot. I'm going to give you a little rundown on what the Brain Bee is and then we're going to get started on childhood and psychiatric disorders. So the Brain Bee is an event that we do every year and it, we've been doing it for four years now. And we usually send volunteers to your high schools to um, teach you the material from the brainfacts.org book. And throughout these months, you're going to be learning all of the stuff that you're going to need to actually come and participate at UCF. And then during the actual event, you guys are going to have three phases. So phase number one is going to be a multiple choice exam. Phase number two is going to be a lab imaging exam, which means we're just going to put pictures on the projector for you guys to uh, see and point what those structures in the brain are. And the third component is a round robin. So to qualify to the third component, we add up the scores of the first phase and the second phase. And the top 15 students who have the highest scores combined will participate in the round robin. And in the round robin, you have faculty and, t and um, doctors ask you questions about the central nervous system or the brainpacks.org book. And you have two lives. So if you answer it correctly, you are going to write it on your whiteboard. And up on doing so, uh, if you get it wrong, then you lose one life. And if you lose another life, then you're disqualified and you proceed to go see your peers continue um, competing. And the top three students, uh, we're hopefully going to try and give you guys some type of scholarship. But the first place gets to go to the National Brain Bee. So hopefully you guys enjoy this experience. We really, really appreciate your participation. We couldn't do it without you guys. And without further ado, we're going to get started on childhood and psychiatric disorders. So first, we're going to have some basic neuroanatomy, right? And with the basic neuroanatomy, what it means is um, <clears throat> I'm going to teach you guys a little bit about what you guys should know for the brain, right? So we have four lobes, the frontal lobe, the parietal lobe, the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe. And the frontal lobe deals with all of your high cognitive functions. So all of your organization skills, all of your planning, all of your higher critical thinking, you can attribute it to to this beautiful orange lobe right here. The parietal lobe has to do with your senses, particularly touch. So everything you touch and feel, it's processed by this lobe, right? And then it makes some output out of it, which means essentially all the information that you acquire has to be put into work. So you have to make sure that whatever you're sensing makes sense, right? The fact that you guys are uh, sitting down and touching like your textbooks and whatnot, you know, your brain has to process that and under, understand it. So all of your sensations and um, spatial functioning also come into play with that one. Your occipital lobe is pretty simple. That has to do with vision. So vision's, vision um, is crucial. And your temporal lobe, it's for memory and language. So memory and language are going to be very, very, very important um, because... <clears throat> um, Without those, you couldn't really do a lot of the things that we do today, right? So the hippocampus, which is this little boy right here, right? If you go back, the temporal lobe right here, if you were to cut it, right? Then you would see the hippocampus laying right here. And that's very important for memory. And we're going to see how this relates to psychology, right? And in the limbic system, right? So all of these parts are part of your limbic system. I'm sure you guys have heard of the amygdala. Right? And all of this is important for your emotions. And again, this is very, very important because some of these psychiatric disorders or psychological disorders have a lot to do with your emotions and how we process them. So hopefully that makes some sense. I recommend you guys to watch the other video that we sent your teachers about brain anatomy uh, done by Sebastian. So hopefully that really, really helps you get a little bit more familiar with the brain. So let's get started with the good stuff. We're going to start with autism. Autism spectrum disorder, it's a, it's a developmental disorder that impairs the ability to communicate and interact. And what that means is that people who have autism spectrum disorder don't have the social skills that we typically would see on, on younger kids or even some of the adults that have this disorder, right? And that is because their ability to communicate has been severely diminished because when they were little, they didn't develop those skills properly. For one or another reason, they just weren't able to develop these social skills that are very, very important for forming um, relationships and things like that. And so <clears throat> to be diagnosed with uh, autism spectrum disorder, you have to qualify based on two criteria. So you have to have both of these to be considered 
in, under the autism spectrum, sort of. And so it's impaired social interaction and communication, which again, you, it can present itself when younger kids don't really have the ability to make friends, you know? They're uh, lacking some, some friendships and relationships when they're younger, and, and they spend a lot of the time alone playing by themselves, right? And communication. Typically, somebody who has autism doesn't communicate with a lot of words. Sometimes they make a lot of noises or grunting um, because they're not very proficient with with talking the way that I'm doing right now or the way that you guys do when you're out with your peers. Repetitive behaviors or obsessive interests. This is one of the uh, red flags that I would definitely know, right? Because somebody who has been diagnosed with autism, when they're younger, for example, if you were to give them a a truck like a like a like a toy truck right i remember when i was little i would draw on the ground with chalk or marker or whatever i could to get my hands on like streets and things like that and i would actually use all my cars and pretend there was like a city right but somebody who has autism they might actually just be focused on one part of the of the toy like the, the wheels they'll just be constantly rotating the wheels and playing with the wheels and um, that's not really something normal when, when you're thinking about kids. If you think about kids, if you have little brothers or sisters or nephews and nieces, then you know how hyperactive they are and how they like they can barely focus on one toy at a time. You know, they want to play with all of them at the same time. So that's definitely something that I would look, look out for as far as uh, being able to determine whether somebody has autism or not. Right, their intelligence though is unimpaired. So most of these people are actually very, very intelligent and high functioning. So there's different types of autism. Uh, we're not gonna go over all of them because there's there's quite a few. But what we call high functioning autism is what um, people with really, really high intelligence have more than the average uh, autism communicating skills, and they're able to perform their activities a little bit better. But a lot of the times, these these kids, these people are very, very, very smart. Right. It is unfortunately a lifelong disorder unless um, it's worked with and you go to therapy for it. It's something that it's, it's, it's difficult to completely remove, right? Uh, the therapy will focus in improving those social skills and interactions so that you become more proficient at either school or your job or whatever social interaction situation that you might be in. So these therapies are really focused on enhancing those social skills, right? And uh, something that is very, very interesting is this, this last two uh, bullet points I want you to, to really, really make a note of, right? There's new research suggesting that the diet of a mother while she's pregnant could actually be related to autism. And that is because in our gastrointestinal tract, right, your GI, um, you have a, a lot of microbes. We call it the gut microbiome. And they're actually responsible for shaping the pH and the conditions in, in the gut and some foods that you ingest can actually have a, a uh, an effect on on it and when you're pregnant all of that can actually transfer to the to the embryo uh, via the placenta and have some type of impact in the development so that they're looking at how this is definitely playing a role based on the diets of, of, of pregnancy mothers so eating eating healthy is very very important and lastly uh, that I want you to make note of on this slide is there's definitely no connection between autism and, and, and vaccinations, guys. Um, if you guys ever plan on uh, having families um, when you guys get older and finish school and high school and college, then I would definitely um, want you to remember that autism is not related to vaccines. So, so please, please don't ever believe that. If you know somebody that does and they tell you, just, just do uh, be courteous, be nice. Acknowledge what they said, but do not trust it at all, right? We always go with the side of science, and science states that there's no connection whatsoever. Um, here's some cool statistics. So the more chances of being autistic are also related to uh, siblings. So if, if you have a brother or if you know a bro somebody who has somebody that has autism, then and if they have a sibling, they have 20% more chance of developing it. So, for example, if I were autistic and I had a sibling, then my sibling would be 20% uh, more likely to develop autism as well, right? It gets higher with twins, identical twins. If you guys remember, identical twins share almost the same genetic DNA, 99% um, of, the, of the genome similar. And these are some, some genes that I would definitely keep in mind. Um, uh, if you guys are interested in research or going into anything related in the, in the medical field, 
these genes are, are associated with, with the autism. So any genetic mutation in these will, will definitely have an effect. Um, because of this defect, then their brains develop a little bit faster, which is why sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for them to, to, to interact with others is because their, their brains are, are growing at a faster rate and they develop some of the um, higher functions a little bit quicker, but that doesn't really correlate with their age. So, so it's kind of hard for, for, for the brain to put um, um, highly developed critical thinking with little social skills or very very childish social skills right and so um they do have a little bit of a a brain growth much much earlier on right there's no current treatment other than like i said therapy um and oxytocin so oxytocin if you guys remember what is oxytocin right i'll give you a few minutes to think about what oxytocin is and oxytocin is a love hormone it's a neurotransmitter that we secrete so whenever your parents give you a hug or they give you a kiss or you know, anybody shows any type of affection, we tend to release this. And through this oxytocin, we're actually to improve our social relationships and, and bond. So the love hormone is very, very important sometimes. So they're looking into seeing if, if increasing the levels of oxytocin can help uh, people with autism. Okay. If you have any questions, feel free to pause the video at any point. Talk among yourselves and, and discuss. Um, and uh, hopefully by this now you've read the chapters. They're easy chapters, and, and there's a lot more information there that I think will be really, really helpful. So we're going to move on to ADHD. ADHD, Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, also known as um, ADHD. Sorry, that was repetitive. Um, one of the most commonly diagnosed childhood conditions. So um, this is characterized by inattentiveness, hyperactivity, and impulsive behaviors. And essentially what this means is that people who have ADHD, are very very high energy and they have little attention span or focus so somebody who has attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is not able to sit still for a long period of time because their high energy and their uh, lack of focus doesn't enable them to do so right so um, that's that's essentially the, the gist of it however to be diagnosed with ADHD you have to remember it has to interfere with your normal everyday functioning what does that mean that means that at some point throughout school or your job, your lack of attention and your hyperactivity do not allow you to continue doing what you would typically do. So you will not be able to finish homework, you will not be able to finish a deadline at job, um, you wouldn't be able to really, really do your tasks daily because of this lack of attention and high, high energy, right? There's really no true diagnosis. Most of it relies on the fact that um, Usually your teachers will be the first ones to notice. They will relay that communication to your parents and then your parents will take you to a clinician or take the patient to a clinician and see if they do qualify for this ADHD um, component, right? So there's really no true way of testing for it. It's other than, than maybe looking at some, some, um, some pattern of behavior throughout the, the, the course of, of education of, of the kids, right? Um, there's uh, medications, but they, they work very, very differently per kid because they have different metabolic rates. So they process medicines a little bit different, so not every medicine works the same. So we go back into behavioral treatment and changing that way of thinking and uh, training your brain to do things a little bit differently. Exercise and meditation are also very, very important. So I'm going to give you a minute or so to think, why do you think exercise particularly? Do you think it's important? Okay, so exercise is particularly important because if you have all this activity, all this energy, right, you have to somehow displace it somewhere. And usually the best way to do so is by exercising. All that excess energy that you may have can be put into something else, and then that reduces the amount of energy that you have, but keeping just enough to continue doing your tasks. So exercise, I'm a, I'm a big uh, habit of exercise and sports, so definitely always a good thing. Down syndrome. So what is Down syndrome? Trisomy 21. Um, this is because we have an extra copy of chromosome 21. And this is um, a little bit of the easier ones to recognize. And that is because of these distinctive facial features and body features. So they have a flattened face, slanted eyes, small ears. They're typically shorter than most people. And they have small um, 
limbs like small uh, small feet and hands so this is something that you'd be able to see fairly quickly if somebody has down syndrome and that is because of this um, um, extra co copy of, of chromosome 21 their, their intelligence on this particular case it does become a little bit affected so they don't have the usual energy um, intelligence that most people would do but that doesn't mean they're not able to finish high school or even have jobs a lot of the times they will be able to finish uh, high school and even uh, college and hold uh, important jobs so it's very very impressive to see how some of these kids are able to continue uh, developing fairly well um, in their lives right Unfortunately, people who have Down syndrome will eventually develop Alzheimer's, and that is because of chromosome 21, which encodes for APP, and that is called amyloid precursor protein. And amyloid precursor protein is essentially what turns into uh, beta amyloid when, when um, Alzheimer's fully develops. So that's why eventually everybody who has Down syndrome will, will unfortunately develop Alzheimer's uh, the majority of the times, right? There's no current treatment other than therapy again. And occupational therapy in this particular point is very, very important because occupational therapy is really what helps them become better at what they do, right? So that's, that's something really, really good to know. All right, so now we're going to talk about dyslexia. It's the most common and best studied uh, part of the, of the um, psychological disorders. And this is an inability to, to pronounce or read properly. Um, but uh, the intelligence is not affected, and it's usually diagnosed early in elementary school. So let's see what's going on with dyslexia, right? So here's the neuroscience. Here's what we all came for, right? So in dyslexia, what usually happens is that, again, if you guys recognize your lobes, here's the frontal lobe, here's the parietal lobe, here's the occipital lobe, and the temporal lobe, right? And we have these very, very important uh, aspects of the brain that help us with... Um, actually making words or reading words or pronouncing words and that is because we have the visual word form area right here we have the visual cortex which is in the occipital lobe we have Broca's area which allows you to produce language and so essentially what happens is you are for example we're gonna pretend this person is reading something so they're reading where my laser is right and so they read that information comes through right they're able to recognize the words right via the visual system they're able to also recognize the names and sounds that they have to make the phenomenic phonemic representation sorry and then they're able to produce a language so broker this area is good for language production right and so all of these work together to actually make um, uh, sounds and words and reading and so um, these form these uh, parts of the brain are very very important for um, actually reading and, and communicating right so this is very very important this is the neuroscience behind it so again uh, Broca's area right here the visual word form area the visual cortex and then they relay information right here's where you process the sounds and this is how you actually make the language we're gonna go into epilepsy Epilepsy is an uncontrolled neuronal discharge. And so what that means is that your neurons are firing uncontrollably. If you remember, guys, your action potential, that means that your neurons are producing so many action potentials that now it's creating convulsions, right? Uh, there's many types of epilepsy. We're not going to get into them, but this is what it's characterized by. They can last three to five minutes. Um, we can see seizures as being staring into the deep uh, space. Right? This is usually for, for younger kids between 3 and 4, um, sometimes up to 6 or 10 years old. Um, and then the other ones that we commonly know as an epilepsy due to the seizure component is a violent and control movements, right? So I want you to know the two types. Generalized, they affect both hemispheres of the brain, while focal only affects one area of the brain. So focal, you can think about it as just one part of the brain that is creating too many action potentials, and generalized as the entire brain, right? To diagnose it, we rely heavily on the EEG, which is uh, for reading the electrical patterns in our brain. EEG, is, it's a good tool to use for, for electricity in the brain. And it's because we have too much glutamate. So glutamate is the most excitatory neurotransmitter in the brain. And too much of it 
actually causes the neurons to fire uncontrollably and then that firing uncontrollably is what leads to the seizures, right? So that's what epilepsy really is. So here's some medications that I would definitely know and some surgeries that are pretty cool. This is what we really, really like about um, neuroscience is how to, how to treat this. And I would definitely watch this video if you guys have the time. It's, it's, it's a short video, so definitely make sure you have the time to watch it. So what happened here is the EEG of, um, of uh, irregular erratic brain. You see the patterns are very, very spiked, very um, uncontrolled, whereas the normal one, they're regular ones, like you'd see. Surgery is temporal lobectomy. That means getting rid of the temporal lobe, and I have a picture showing that here. Right, so this is the the right temporal lobe, and I know you might be confused as to why, but when you're looking at CT imaging, you actually look at it the opposite way. So this would be the right side of the patient, and you can see that he had a right temporal lobectomy. So the temporal lobe is gone. You can see it gone here. You can see it gone here, and that is because the seizure component more than likely came from here, right? And that's where the the, the neurons were all acting up. And so the easiest way to treat it if the medication didn't work was to remove it. Hemispherectomy would be to remove both, oh, I mean, sorry, not both, but all of it. So as a hemispherectomy, you would you would think of removing all of one hemisphere. The corpus callosum resection would be to cut the corpus callosum right here, right? This, this fiber right here. And a lobectomy is any other lobe other than the, the temporal lobe, right? So that's epilepsy. Pretty cool stuff. Anxiety disorders. So these are the most common mental disorders experienced by Americans, and uh, they, they are classified into these four that we're going to talk about. And then um, that should be it for the lesson today, I believe. Oh, no, we're still missing depression So and bipolar disorder. So, so we're going to talk about those for a little bit. But um, serotonin is the, is the most important neurotransmitter here. So serotonin plays a big role in, in, in most anxiety disorders because this controls your mood. Right, so serotonin controls your mood. So OCD, OCD is the one that you probably guys have heard most of because this is the one that you know people do a lot of things repetitively. So, um, for example, someone who has OCD would lock the door seven times, and what that means is that they have this intrusive thought of of thinking, "Oh, I didn't lock the door," even though they did. Right. And then their behavior would be like, okay, we got to check it again. And then they would have the thought, oh, I didn't close it. And they would check it again. So here it's actually kind of interesting because the, the compulsive behavior is trying to compensate their obsessive thought. So, so they think the brain is thinking itself, oh, maybe this repetitive behavior will alleviate the thought. But it, in reality, the thought never goes away and the behavior just exacerbates the problem, right? So it's usually uh, the reward system affected. So, you know. The dopaminergic pathways here. This is dopamine based. Uh, it's affected, and um, that is because um, they can't really. They they, they feel a, a satisfaction of doing it. So, so by checking it, their satisfaction levels go up really really quickly. So they, they feel that reward instantaneously. Panic disorder. It's an intense irrational fear, a frightening of physical symptoms. Uh, here, you actually have a physical response, so you have an increased heart rate, you sweat, and you have dizziness, so you actually have a physical component to this part, and this one, it uh, can happen randomly throughout the day, so they may be just having a nice lunch or a dinner, or they might be at any type of event that you may think of, and all of a sudden, they, hit, they have a panic disorder that just triggers uncontrollable fear, right, and they don't really know why it's coming from, right? So um, the, the, the mood disorder also is accompanied by depression or bipolar disorders, unfortunately. So, so a lot of these are going to be seen with depression. Post-traumatic stress disorder. This is also one of the fun ones. Uh, this is usually because of a very horroring traumatic event, such as military combat, combat or, or physical or sexual abuse. And it's a horroring experience to the point where your brain actually can't really process what is happening and it actually goes into trauma, right? Uh, people who have PTSD have flashbacks, uh, night sweats, memories of the event, and hyperarousal. So, uh, for example, some uh, uh, I think there's an episode on um, Grey's Anatomy, uh, somebody told me, where somebody who with PTSD has an accident in a helicopter, and and all of a sudden they see the fan, um, and, and the fan triggers the memory. So that's actually pretty accurate, something that you would see, right? 
and then you have high levels of cortisol, which are for sweat, and norepinephrine, which is adrenaline. So, so PTSD actually actually is um, very very difficult to treat, and we'll see why. So here you can see the hippocampus, right, right here, the hippocampus area. In PTSD, it actually shrinks. So people who suffer from PTSD, their hippocampus shrinks. And uh, what's a hippocampus for? Let me give you guys a few minutes, right? So yes, correct. It is for memory. So so people who have PTSD, they have a, a shrunken uh, uh, hippocampus. That's a physical, biological toll in their brain. Major depression. So major depression has full hallmarks that have to be met. You have to be either empty or sad. Feeling empty means you feel like a void. Like you might have a lot of things, families, relationships, even material things, but you still feel empty. And then sad, obviously, we've all felt sad. Uh, loss of appetite or excessive eating. Irritability and problems with sleep. So you have to you have to be at least one out of the one of the one of the first one of the second one of one of the third, and you definitely have to be uh, with problems with sleep. So you have to have um, all of these four. Well, there's six, but you know you have to have four out of the six for sure. People who suffer from diabetes, heart conditions, cancer, and addiction usually have major depression because they're long-term conditions that obviously would make them very, very depressed. And men are less likely uh, than women. So women are 7 to 10 times more likely to develop depression. Uh, it can be a lot of things, but we're going to focus on dopamine and serotonin, right? So these are your neurotransmitters are, are with moods, and um, this is really, really something that really affects you. So dopamine is for, for uh, reward pathway. So dopamine is really good with making you feel good uh, really, really quickly. And serotonin is for your mood, so your overall mood. So increasing the levels of such would really, really cure uh, depression or help you alleviate depression, right? Um, but remember, everybody's different, so it might not work for everybody. Bipolar disorder. So bipolar disorder is Characterized by intense mood changes from very, very high to severe lows. Um, very, very highs, meaning like they're very, very energetic and manic. And lows are like also all to the point of suicidal. And you can have some for like, you can be high for months or weeks. And then you can be low for months or weeks. So they come in, in, in phases. They come in clusters. So bipolar disorder is very, very difficult to treat because... You, you don't know at what point their, their mood's going to change. But uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, again, and lithium, uh, the, the, the medication lithium helps. So very, very important to keep this in mind, right? So bipolar disorder. Um, schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is disturbing thinking, emotions, say behavior, loss of touch of reality. So, so people who have schizophrenia, they have these feelings of persecution. They, have their, they feel like people are out there to get them. They always make these irrational thoughts. That don't really make sense because they're always thinking that um, somebody's trying to to set them up or or, or get them um, to confess something that they didn't do or, or things like that. So so it's very very interesting to see how their thought process becomes completely irrational, and this is because you have way too much dopamine. So um, loss of dopamine, not enough dopamine, is actually related to Parkinson's, but too much is related to schizophrenia. And then we have some symptoms. Positive symptoms means Symptoms that are present that shouldn't be, and negative symptoms are things that sh are not there that should be. So, for example, positive symptoms are the hallucinations and the, um, the delusions, right? That's something that shouldn't be, but we call it positive because it's present. And negative, something that should be there but it's not, is, for example, lack of motivation. So, people should always be motivated to some extent. You know, like, I'm motivated right now to make this video. Um, so, now people with schizophrenia have positive symptoms being... Things that we don't have and negative symptoms being things that we we do want, right? So also excessive amounts of dopamine, like I said before. Um, target dopamine. So if you have too much dopamine, you want to break it down. And sometimes if you're mixed diagnosed with Parkinson's, uh, because if you're mixed diagnosed with Parkinson's, so let's think about this for a minute. If you have Parkinson's, you don't have enough dopamine, right? That's lack of. But if somebody gets misdiagnosed, with Parkinson's, and they think they have Parkinson's, but they don't, right? 
They're going to give him medication to increase dopamine, even though their dopaminergic levels are normal. So that's going to trigger the dopamine to go excessively up and create schizophrenia. So you have to be very, very careful when, when diagnosing people with this, okay? So schizophrenia is really, really fun. So I have a little quiz for you. I'm going to, guys, give you like a minute to answer them. What is the limbic system for? What neurotransmitter is highly associated with anxiety disorders? And what's the chromosome? what chromosome codes for APP? So guys, think about it. All right, give you a few minutes. So the answers are emotions. Yes, the limbic system helps you process emotions, right? Neurotransmitter associated with anxiety disorders, serotonin. Serotonin is very, very important for your mood, and mood is related to anxiety. And chromosome 21, APP. Extra bonus question, what does APP stand for? Amyloid precursor protein. So I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please let us know if there's any feedback. This is the first time we've done this. And we're really, really excited. So just, just let us know what you guys think about it. Feel free to watch it however many times you want. Read the chapters. And um, hopefully we'll be able to send you some volunteers. Or if your professors are finally able to, to, to um, have us come by, we will definitely do so. So thank you so much, guys. Enjoy it. And we'll see you sometime soon.